we didn't go into every apartment. And we just took her word that everything was cool. And then you get in there and you find out, oh dear, <laughs> <laughs> this is not exactly what I thought it was going to be. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. Hello and welcome to episode 74. My guest today is Lonnie Shields, an investor here in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area who owns single family and small multifamily properties. Now, Lonnie has a lot of interesting things going on. First of all, he's transitioning out of Grand Rapids with his investing and moving into an entirely new market. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, Lonnie's also in the process of selling his five unit and doing it through a 1031 exchange. So we're going to talk about the mechanics of a 1031 exchange. And uh, Lonnie, you also hold a couple properties in a self-directed IRA. I do. I do. Well, I can't wait to hear about that. But before we get into those details, why don't you uh, expand on my introduction and, and tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thanks, Brian. Um, my wife and I moved to Grand Rapids in 1977 from Phoenix, we met in college and got married on graduation day. <laughs> so that was a life changer. Two celebrations. <laughs> there you go. Saved a little money there. There you go. Economy of scale. <laughs> and uh, so uh, in 1981, we planted a church here, New Life Christian Fellowship, that's up on Knapp Street, just a half a mile west of the Beltline. And so for 34 years, I was the senior pastor there at New Life. Then in 2012, November of 2012, a lady ran a red light on the Beltline and hit us as we were turning left off of uh, uh, onto the Beltline, uh, hit us doing about 65. And so there was another life-changing day. Um, I spent 51 days in the hospital, and uh, my wife just finished a couple of months ago her 13th surgery trying to uh, correct the injuries and, and uh, bring healing to her body. And uh, so that was a life changer. You know, after getting out of the hospital and recuperating for a while, I started trying to get back, started working 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week, and just realized I can't do this anymore. I don't have the stamina to be a senior pastor, to be a senior leader. And um, so we turned the church over to my associate, who was more than ready to handle that. He's doing a great job. I sit on the front on the front row every Sunday and cheer him on. Uh, but now you have a new problem. I really wasn't ready to retire. I hadn't wasn't planning on retiring. Uh, although we started in 2009 was when we bought our five unit because um, my wife was selling real estate at that point. This was one of her listings. And we just realized the day is going to come when we'll need to retire. And when you plant your own church, there's usually not a pension involved. And so um, we started looking around to figure out how we could do this. And it seemed like real estate was a key. We read a, a book. Uh, probably most of the people listening have read Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And uh, that was a life-changing book for us because it got us thinking in a new direction. You know, I was a classic poor dad sort of guy. You know, my dad was a fireman and uh, worked two jobs and um, we just kind of grew up working hard and figuring that was going to take care of, of everything. And uh, as Kiyosaki so uh, uh, graciously explains to us, that usually doesn't work. So we started in 2009, uh, borrowed some money from a friend and bought this five unit and uh, began rehabbing it. And that was the, the beginning of our involvement in real estate here in Grand Rapids. Well, so yeah, like a lot of people and myself included that rich dad, poor dad really kind of <laughs> laid out the groundwork and the reasoning for, yes. you know, why it makes sense to, yes. uh, to invest in real estate, create passive income yep. and, and really grow your wealth that way. Right. Uh, so you read the book and did you immediately go out and buy this five unit or, or how, how long did well, it take it, you to actually take action? <laughs> Oh, it, it took us a little while, you know, you, um, but she was doing real estate. So your wife so, was already a realtor. Yeah, she, and really she's the one who should be doing this interview and should be doing all this stuff. If she weren't uh, recovering from surgery and from the injuries, she's so much better at this sort of thing than I am. Um, 
Uh, but with her being already in real estate, and this was one of her listings, and if you remember 2009 wasn't a very good time, there wasn't a lot happening, we were actually able to buy this for what the lady owed on the loan. And um, Yeah, talk about that. Let's, <clears throat> let's talk about the numbers of that first five unit, because that's a pretty big big step to take to get into real estate investing. Most people feel like a single family is more manageable. <laughs> you jumped right into a, a five unit, which is a, really a commercial property. It is. And the learning curve, the learning curve was <laughs> absolutely ridiculous because we had no clue what we were doing. And here, let me put in a plug for the RPOA. We've, we heard about the RPOA and we got involved just to get the proper forms, to get the right leases and that sort of thing. Somehow we didn't hear about the classes that the RPOA offered. And so we didn't get involved in that. And our learning curve was much more difficult than it could have been or should have been if we had uh, if someone had just told us, hey, RPOA has classes. So I'm telling you, if you're listening, RPOA has classes almost every week. Get a platinum membership. Take every class they offer. It'll save you so much grief. It's amazing. So that's what we did when we got back involved again. You know, after the after the wreck and the little bit of recovery time, then we joined RPOA, got a platinum membership, took every class that they offered for an entire year, and we're cherry picking now, even still. Yeah, well, uh, I know I've seen you in my class yep, twice. Yeah, <laughs> so. that's because I don't. We, you know, we both had what they called a mild traumatic brain injury. Mm. Now that seems like an oxymoron, doesn't it? How can it be mild and traumatic at the same time? Um, what that's done is impacted somewhat my memory. I don't just remember things as well as I used to. And of course, being old doesn't have anything to do with that. It's just from the mm -hmm. back. <laughs> so yeah, so you have to work twice as review hard. Review is uh, important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Review is important. Yeah, I think even without a mild traumatic brain injury, it, it, it helps to review and then maybe take a class once or tw you know twice yeah. or three times sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk about the five unit. I mean, you jumped into that. Uh, it was 2009. So obviously yep. that's a, probably the best possible time to be buying a five right. unit. Right. How much did you pick it up for? We paid one twenty two. One Okay. $122,000. Yep. Uh, and were, did you just take over the mortgage that was that was uh, there, or did you just pay off the remaining amount on the mortgage? We, we paid off the mortgage, and we had some friends who had some money, and they loved us and just wanted to help us. And so they lent us $122,000 on this five unit, and uh, we went from there. Right. So you use private money. Yes. And you get a, like you paid them an interest rate. How did, 5%, how did you I work think. that out? 5%. Yep. Which in 2009, that's more than you're going to get in a bank. Right. In a savings account or a right. CD. Uh, so you essentially picked up a five unit, no money down. Basically. Did yep. you, did you have to put any money, any of your own money into the property? We didn't have any of our own money to put into it. You were a pastor. so <laughs> you, no money. you got it. You got it. Um, the thing that was interesting to me, we didn't know what questions to ask, you know, and, and, and how to go about this process. So we just took this lady's word for everything. And I don't mean to imply when I say that, that she lied to us. I think she just didn't know some of the things that we needed so to know. What, so you were dealing with the, the woman, the seller directly. Right, right. And what did she tell you that turned out not to be true? Well, just for example, all the electrical has been redone, you know, well, a couple of years later, we had an electrical fire in the attic, and then the electrical got redone. <laughs> <laughs> Did it still have the old knob and tube? Was no, a lot of these I, properties? Uh, no, I, it didn't have knob and tube. Someplace it had been redone, but I think what had happened was that her dad was a handyman and lived in one of the apartments and sort of managed it for her. And so I think he redid it, but I don't think he was really an electrician. You know, we talked to one of the inspectors after the fire and he said, yeah, it looked like a bowl of spaghetti up there. Uh, so her <laughs> understanding of the electrical has all been redone. Was right. Not, uh, yeah. Not, not, really e code not exactly. Yeah. Not exactly the way it should have been redone. Right. So what are some of the other things you were told that turned out not to be true? Well, that was the main one. Um, it, it, it just, 
the whole the whole idea of deferred maintenance or maintenance that had been done but not been done properly um you know <laughs> those were really the issues we we didn't go into every apartment you know we just took her word that you know uh, some of the tenants weren't available to get into you know and um, so we didn't go into every apartment and we just took her word that everything was cool and then you get in there and you find out oh <laughs> This, after this, the fact, yeah, after, after the fact, the property. right, right. Now then, you're you're turning over some tenants, and you're in the apartments, and you're going, oh dear, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not exactly what I thought it was going to be. You know, uh, we went back to our friends and borrowed fifteen thousand dollars to redo all the windows because all the windows were terrible, and. Um, uh, of course, after the fire, then there were a number of improvements that were taken care of through that. Um, so, so on the whole, we've done a great deal to this building to bring it up to. Uh, uh, it's in much better shape now than it was when we bought it in two thousand nine. So you would think that paying what did you pay one twenty one twenty two one twenty two for a five unit? Yeah, you're getting a great bargain. Yes. But of course, if it's in financial distress, that means that the previous owner did not really have the money to put back into it. Right. Any fixes they did were probably temporary. Right. Uh, so you always have to assume that you're going to end up spending a lot more right. money. How much more money did you, do you think you've put into this property? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, with... Uh you know, that was one of the things that we really didn't do well on the front end was all the record keeping. Um, we had a friend who was uh, doing handyman work for us. And and I would say, you know, it's just hard to say. And I can't look back on all of that and just pull out facts and figures. I would say we probably put, I'd say $50,000 into it. Okay. Not, which Maybe. isn't still not yeah. bad. Yeah. And, and you're in the process of selling it right, right. now. Um, how much did you have it on the market for? Two thirty three is what we got out of it. Okay, two thirty three. Yeah. So that's really pretty good. I mean, yeah. if you you're still making a pretty good profit plus yeah. whatever cash flow you've made right over the uh, the time over the that years. You've owned yep. It. So um, on the whole, that that turned out. So why did you decide to sell it? Well, it's several reasons. Um, we we just felt like you know the whole theory is you buy low and sell high. And it seems like Grand Rapids is at a real high place right now. And um, so so we just felt like if we can get out of this one, um, one of the challenges that you face with a commercial property is the expenses are a little more than with single family rentals. You know, you have to pay uh, trash and you have to take care of the lawn mowing and the snow plowing and you have to take care of the water bill. And so we thought if we could get out of this, get more into single families, some of those expenses are less and the rents are maybe a little bit more. So we're, we're, uh, we're hopeful that we're, we're going to be able to uh, – actually, here's my goal. I probably shouldn't say this, but here's my goal. My goal is to be able to double the income that we get uh, through, through selling this property. Okay, so let's talk about that because you're doing a 1031 exchange. <laughs> yes, we are. Um, and and we, sh I, I think now's the appropriate time to reveal the new market that you're moved. <laughs> you're, you've already moved into. We have. So let's start with the transition. You you you've basically sold off all your properties in Grand Rapids except for a duplex. This is we, what we what have one told. two unit left. Yeah, one two unit. Where are you moving your your investing portfolio to? Well. Uh, 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 probably a year and a half or so ago, I met a guy at the RPOA breakfast who began talking to me about Muskegon and um, introduced me to West Shore Property Management over there. And a couple of the guys there at West Shore were in Colorado. They looked all over the country for a market that they could find. They were looking for a market that was depressed, but on its way back. And they moved to Muskegon. And so um, I went over and started talking to them. They kind of showed me around. And the things that were, it, it was amazing to me, 
the changes that I saw in Muskegon from some years ago. You know, the coal-fired power plant is gone, and the, the tannery's gone. You know, all, all of the things that seem to make Muskegon not quite that desirable. Very gritty <laughs> and industrial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. those, those areas were gone, and they're being redeveloped. And so um, somebody's putting some big money in there, you know. Uh, and um, you know, one of the things that we did some things a few years ago with investing in the stock market just on your own. And one of the one of the uh, phrases that I heard used was, "You follow the elephant through the jungle," you know. <laughs> and so if if big money is coming in over there, then my little tiny bit of money <laughs> might might be able to follow that elephant in. And uh, make some money. So that's that's the plan. That's where we're headed. Okay. So you that this was a couple of years ago when we met Shane. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, so you're talking about Shane, right? Shane, whose last name we can't pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> but people who know Shane know who we're talking right. about. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so you followed the the elephant into Muskegon. Right. What kind of properties did you start buying there? We. We, one of the things that I've learned about Muskegon is that the majority of the houses there seem to be smaller two-bedroom, one-bath houses. Now, the, uh, maybe it's just the places that I've been looking, but it seems like there are far more two-bedroom homes than three-bedroom or four-bedroom homes in Muskegon. And so uh, that's what we've been buying, small two-bedroom homes, um, rent for about 600 bucks a month, and... Um, it's working out well so far. Okay. So um, you're picking up these, these homes for how much? Well, we've spent from, I think I got one for $16,632. Wow. And um, all the way up to, I think we've paid 27 for one that had been pretty well rehabbed. Although here again, you know, you buy this home that's been rehabbed. And the first thing that you have to do as soon as you get a tenant in there is replace the furnace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you do have to put some money in you these do. properties. You're you not do. just picking them up for 16000 and no. throwing a tenant in. You're, uh, you're well, putting some Well, we like to do that. In. And I've, I've been able to do that once. Okay. <laughs> I was able to buy... Uh, a property, I uh, actually paid seventeen five for it. Already had a tenant in it, and um, we'll have to do stuff when that tenant moves out. But for right now, we're just cruising with that one. That's a good one. So let's apply that to the ten thirty one you're doing right now. You're in the process of selling your five unit here in Grand right. Rapids. Right. You're going to ten thirty one uh, into some properties in Muskegon. Right. Talk. Walk us through that process, starting with the, the whole. What is a ten thirty one? And why are you doing it? Well, a 1031 exchange is a program that's been that the government has allowed us to do um, that allows you to ex to trade property, sort of. You can sell your property and buy other proper another property or other properties and defer the capital gains tax. You don't lose it or you don't not have to pay it, but you kick it down the road to when you sell the next property, unless you do a 1031 exchange on that one. So so the advantage of it is that you defer your capital gains on the sale of your property. Now, you have 45 days to identify the property or properties that you're going to buy, and then you have six months to close on those properties. So um, that, that can be a little bit of a challenge when you're trying to do what I'm trying to do, because... Um, I would like to buy eight or ten properties, you know. So take the profit from your five unit. Well, you take all of it. It's not just mm -hmm. the profit. You have so, to you have to put a, it all into right. it. Right. So it's not just profit, but it's right. repayment of principal. And, right. Um, Everything, mm -hmm. the whole sale price has to go into the ten thirty one exchange. Well, minus, minus if you have a mortgage or a loan, uh, right? Any any right. expenses incurred in selling. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, so you've got enough profit to possibly buy eight to ten properties in Muskegon. That's what we're hoping to do. Yeah, right. And pay, and buying them can buy with cash, basically with cash. Right. Okay, so you are closing next week on the five unit tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> and so, have you identified these properties yet? We've been looking. Um, but we haven't identified any formally yet. We got a couple of prospects 
Um, and here's where West Shore, again, has been a tremendous help to us because they have a lot more contacts in that area. They're, they have a broker right on staff there at West Shore. So they have a lot more contacts in the area. There's a fellow over there who has a number of properties and he's moving his focus. So he's going to be selling a number of properties. I may be able to pick up some of his. And when you buy a group of properties, typically you get a better deal than if you buy them one by one by one. So we're hopeful that this will work out well. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, you know, I've talked to people who wanted to do 1031 exchanges, but they've decided that after they've sold the property. Mm. And as you and I both know that at that point, it's too late yeah, because you, you need that. to have a qualified intermediary. Right. So talk about that process. When you decided you wanted to do a 1031 exchange, uh, who did you talk to and, and what's that process like? Well, I talked to the folks at the RPOA office for, for the first, the first, uh, my first resource, and then I just talked to some other folks in real estate around the area who I felt had a lot more experience than I do at this sort of thing. And they kept referring me. I had several people refer me to Equity Exchange, and uh, um, so I talked to Margaret over there. She answered all. My questions sent me a 40-page document about 1031 exchanges and all the forms that I would need to fill out, the, the language that you have to have in your buy-sell agreement, you know, all of the, she just walked me through the process very graciously. And um, so, so it has not been a difficult thing to do at all. I, I'm not through the process yet, but so far yeah, it's but, been good. But you, you, you're in the right direction because yes. at least two weeks before you close on the property, you need to get that qualified right. intermediary in place. Right. Give them time to do the paperwork. When you when you close tomorrow, you will not get access to the money. Right. The qualified intermediary. Uh, they take it all. <laughs> which, which is Margaret at Equity Exchange will take uh, possession of that money right? and they will hold on to it. right? And then when you f identify within 45 days, your eight to 10 properties right? or however many they can be. And, and that's the great thing about a 1031 is you don't just have to exchange like right. for like, you can exchange your five unit for single family or, rental or single family rental for a five uh, unit. Yep. I mean, you can go exactly. in any direction. It's just, yep. um, you, so, so once you make that exchange, once you identify in 45 days, then how much time do you have to actually close? They give you properties? 180 days oh, okay. to close. Yeah. So we should be able to do that without too much trouble, he said optimistically. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're paying cash. So you don't, you don't have to worry about the loan process. Really, right. it seems like once you've identified the properties, right. you're, you're good to go. Right. Um, and so now, that's, that's, that's nice. Here's the challenge for us, mm -hmm. because um, all of the properties that we've purchased, even the ones that we thought were rehabbed, we've had to put money into. But you can't use the 1031 money to do repairs or to do rehabbing. You can only use it for purchasing the properties. So that may be an area, whereas if I just took the money, you know, paid the capital gains, then I could do whatever I wanted with it. I could use it for repairs. I could use it for a trip to Vegas, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, this, this way, I've got to come up with other money. If I have to make repairs, I'm going to have to find money someplace else or, to make repairs. Uh -oh. Or you can do what I did Talk to because me. I faced the same situation when I uh, did a 1031 exchange from a four unit into a five unit. Uh -huh. There were repairs that needed to be made, including a new roof mm. and, a, and a new water boiler. I, um, at the time, because of the market, I, I said, well, I'll pay asking price, but I want you, Mr. Seller, to, to do, do these, these things, repairs right. before we close. Right. So in your case, you could overpay right. and build in the cost of those repairs. Right. So that way the seller does them on his dime, mm -hmm. but uh, increases the, the price right. to reflect those repairs. There so you go. that's one way to do it. Th and that's a good strategy. <laughs> yeah. So keep that in mind. I, I certainly will. Yeah. I certainly will. Because, um, yeah, they, I, that's a, a weird rule that uh, forces you to get creative. Yeah. 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 Um, so th th that's the 1031 you're hoping. So t the economics of these eight to 10 properties, what, what price range are you buying them in? Uh, what, what areas of Muskegon are you looking? 
Well, the, we haven't bought anything in the Heights. And one of the one of the challenges there is just that there seems to be some corruption in that area, you know. So, so you don't want to yeah, have you're, to you're deal think, with that. Yeah, you're dealing with some cor- what, what what I'm hearing is that there's a little hanky panky going yeah. on with uh, the city certification and yeah. the heights. So, so we have just stayed away from there. We're we're looking any place, and honestly, what we've done before is these small two bedrooms. I think I have one. I have two two units over there, and I have one three bedroom. Most of the stuff we have is small two bedrooms, and that's working. I'm open to just about anything as long as it gives me good cash flow. So, what is good cash flow? I mean, if you're buying, say, in the fifteen to thirty thousand dollar range, that seems like the type of range right. that you're looking that's at. That's where we've been. Yep. Um, what kind of rents are you getting from these properties? Five fifty to six hundred bucks a month. Okay, five fifty yeah. to six hundred a month. Mm-hmm. And what kind of cash flow does that give you? What's your expense ratio? Um, we're on the front end. You have to do a little more rehabbing and that sort of thing with some of these properties. So some of them, you know, they're putting six hundred bucks a month in, and it's all going right back. It's out all going again, back to the know? property. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the fifty percent thing that most people look at is really pretty accurate. So pretty accurate yeah. for these types of properties yeah. uh, that are single family. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so fifty uh, percent. So you're you know you're you're depending on whether you're paying fifteen to thirty thousand, putting some of that money back in. You're probably looking at anywhere from ten to twenty percent return on your money. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Which and once you get them up and running. Uh, that's then good. it's a lot pa- better. That's good passive income, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it that's, sure is. That's a great retirement plan, right there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There you go. So, since you um, stepped down from being a pastor, has real estate provided the income for you? Well, it's getting there. You know, um, we're still having more go out than comes in every month. Um, And so that's part of why we're hoping that we can, with the sale of this five unit, increase the amount of monthly income that we have coming in. Uh, Because we're still not at a place of breaking even yet. You know, I was not ready to retire when when this accident happened, Uh, both mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, you know, this was just an out of the blue life changer. Completely unexpected. Totally whacked us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the self-directed IRA Yeah, and, and how that is working for you. So you own two properties in a self-directed IRA. Right. Right. What, how did, how did you learn about a self-directed IRA? Talk, talk us through that process from you saying, Hey, this, Sounds interesting. It might be something to do to actually doing it with two properties. Well, I had an IRA that that was losing me money is the way I looked at it anyway. You know, it wasn't producing anything. And, uh, you know, here we are moving more towards uh, real estate as passive income. And um, my experiences with the stock market, you know, remember that we took some courses to do we weren't doing day trading, but we were doing some trading on the stock market ourselves. And you know, my wife was really in charge of that, and and she got us out at just the right time. We never lost a dime in the stock market, you know, when she was handling it. But we could have, you know. And one of the things that I've learned is I like to invest where I have more control. <laughs> I mean, even with real estate, you don't have total control because the furnace can go out without asking your permission. But you have a lot more control than you do with something like the stock. You market. can go to your property. You can touch I your can. property. Yes. You can work on your property. Absolutely. When you own a stock, you don't even know <laughs> exactly what, where, or what, or who exactly. you're dealing with. And you're you're betting that someone else knows what they're doing, you know, and is going to grow this business. And and there's just all kinds of factors that are out of your control. And I don't like that. I like to have much more uh, control of things. So, um, I, you know, I think I honestly think it was somebody at uh, at one of the conferences that talked about a self-directed IRA. You know, one of the other things that, that's been so great with the RPOA is having their conference every 
uh, February and bringing in these gurus from all around the country to expand our uh, paradigms a little bit, you know, help us to look different ways, um, do things differently, grow. You know, I, I, I can't emphasize enough, I think, the importance of education and of growing and of learning from people that know more about this than you do. I, you know, honestly, Brian, I was surprised when you called me to do this podcast because I still think of myself as very much a neophyte in this whole area. Um, so, but that was one of the things that one of those speakers suggested was, hey, you did you know that you can do a self-directed IRA and you can invest in real estate through your IRA? Well, boy, my ears perked up when I heard that because here's $50,000 that's just sitting there dwindling, you know? In fact, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyway. I, I talked to my guy and said, let's move this out. And he misunderstood. He didn't take it all the way out. He took it. Uh, it was actually in a 403B, 401K. I forget what the numbers were. Um, and and to, to get it out, he, to put it into a self-directed IRA, he had to first change it out of that into an IRA. Well, my instructions to him were to get it out of the IRA and then get it into cash. So that's mm. what I was assuming he was oh, doing. Mm -hmm. He didn't do that. He, he took it out of the 403B and then invested everything right back into the same places that I was invested in an IRA. This was your uh, your stockbroker or your yes uh, your yes financial planner my financial guru and well sure why why yeah financial gurus hate real estate they hate real estate <laughs> investors because they don't make any money off exactly of them. exactly and and I don't think this guy you know he just was doing what he thought I wanted him to do but there was miscommunication there someplace because my understanding was that this was going into cash and then I put it into a self directed IRA when I start trying to do that well no it's in an IRA and it's invested in the stock market in the same place as it was and in the meantime it's dropped two thousand thousand dollars you know mm. <laughs> so you know forgiveness is a real important key <laughs> to life if you're going to continue uh, not going crazy that's a hard one to forgive no. i'd imagine there were tax ramifications for that too um well no it's just a loss you just mm. lost oh, okay. the two grand because then you put it from that ira into a self-directed ira and go from there and it was, I did the same process. I called RPOA, asked them who they recommended, talked to some other friends that had more, and uh, found some folks in Florida that walked me right through the process, and away we go. So, so, you, so you open a self-directed IRA. Yep. Um, anything special we need to know about that? I mean, is it, a, is it just an IRA, traditional? I mean, what, what well, kind can, of IRA is it? Um, you can do, my understanding is you can do a Roth IRA, but mm -hmm. I didn't, I felt like it would be too much of a hit. Because you'd have to pay. Because I'd have to pay the, tax the taxes on that 50 grand. Sure. And um, so I just converted it to a regular IRA, a regular self-directed IRA, and bought two houses in Muskegon. Great. So this was recent then that you did this? Yeah, this uh, uh, January, I think, January, February, someplace So with $50,000, you were able to buy two houses. Yep. Um, are, now, talk, what are the restrictions on how you own and operate those two houses? Well, I don't own them. The IRA owns them. So the IRA owns the them. The IRA owns them. And, uh, free and clear, I'd imagine. Yes, free and clear. Okay. And that, the plan is that one of them will be a rental and the other one will be a flip. So um, uh, that seemed like a good diversification of... <laughs> so one is a long-term hold. Right. That's and the, the other plan. one you're you're fixing up and you're going to flip it. That's the plan. Okay. And it's supposed to be, you know, this is the this has been sort of my um the way things have worked for me with rehabbing things, it never goes as quickly as you think it would be. You know, my hope was to catch the spring market, you know, and sell sell this one then. But it's just it, things, there have just been some complications and things that you didn't expect, you know, repairs that you had to do that you didn't expect to have to do, which is always the case, isn't it? And um, so I don't think it's quite ready, but hopefully within the month, it'll be on the market. So when you own the properties in an IRA and you're putting money in to fix them up, where does that money come from? Has to come out of the IRA. You so cannot mix funds. If, if the money, let's say you've maxed out your money and you don't have the money in the IRA. You're in big trouble. You're Okay. <laughs> so you need to make sure you've got a good right. cushion in that IRA right. to put into improving the property. Exactly. 
Yep. Uh, because otherwise you need to make a contribution to your IRA uh -huh. in, in, in order to repair the properties or do whatever else needs to be done. And yeah. how much are you able to contribute to your IRA each year? Oh my goodness. You're asking questions that I, you need a financial guru. I right? need to know these things. I, <laughs> I think, isn't that like six grand? Is, is it? So that's that's what I I'm getting at. Right. What's the limit now? Six yeah, I grand. think it's like six grand that so, you can do. So if you did, let's say you did run into, like you had to replace a, a water heater or a furnace, you, you may end up having to just contribute six grand to your right. IRA, which right. would then fund the, right. the- Fund the repairs. But you, right. and then as far as spending that money, well, I guess- how does it work? Because somebody has to make the decision to say, let's go ahead and spend money on a new furnace. Is that you who makes that decision? Or do you have a management company that does that for you? Yes and yes. Um, you, I'm working with West Shore there. Mm -hmm. So they have a separate account for the IRA properties that's different from my regular properties. And uh, if something happens, they need money, then then they let me know that. And I have to call the IRA people, and then the IRA people send a check. So there's an added level of, yep. of complexity there. Yes, where, yep. Where uh, you, they, uh, you, but you you still have approval, though. Is it's that, a self-directed IRA. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so you so, have approval over these things, but right. you have people making the decisions. Right. Uh, making the on-the-ground decisions. Making the recommendations. You. Hey, the furnace just went out. You know, you, I, Now here, let me just say this because I didn't know this and I don't know how I missed this, but um, the gas company has a program where if you have a renter in your property that's beneath a certain income level, they will subsidize the replacement of a furnace. So yeah. I've replaced furnaces for like $400. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I'd known this that's in 2009. A, that's a, a great benefit of having <laughs> lower income tenants. It is. Yeah, it is. So that that's that's a good thing to bring up. Is that just here in Michigan? Is that uh, I have no idea about any place else. <laughs> <laughs> but at least in Muskegon, it's working right. for you, huh? Right. Um, any other programs like that where you can get subsidized uh, improvements? Well, I know that here in Grand Rapids, they have some some programs for getting the lead out of out of things. That, yes, I'm uh, familiar Grants with that. available to replace windows and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, when I replaced all the windows. <laughs> <laughs> in my five unit. I didn't know about that grant. Mm. I should have been hanging around to RPA OA more at that time. Yeah. Uh, they do cap the, uh, the rent that you can charge. Mm -hmm. So um, depending on the type of property and the type of residence you have, uh -huh. uh, if you are renting to lower income residents, then great, go sure. for the money. But if you sure. want to get uh, a little higher than, than uh, what the cap is, um, sometimes when you balance out the money you're getting from the get to let out, uh, versus what you could get at market rent, uh, okay. it still makes sense to just pay for it yourself. Yeah, yeah. Hey, but you, but it's worth looking at. Sure, sure. Those more information is rarely a bad thing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so the the self directed IRA is working out well for you. I believe it will. <laughs> <laughs> it will. But are, you, are you still feeding the? Uh, I mean, are you having to? You know, put your six thousand dollars in to to help well, pay for expenses. No, I haven't so far. Um, I tried to keep a little margin. That's one of the, my kids. You know, my kids always uh, remind me that I tried to teach them about margin. You know, at their lives financially and with time and all of that sort of thing. So I tried to maintain some margin in there, um, and. Uh, I sh I think I have a renter moving into the to the rental property this week, so that should begin to generate some funds. And um, my friend over there that's working with me on this rehab was going back through it again to see. Uh, I was over there and just things that I thought had been done hadn't been done yet, and so he he was uh, going to put the spurs to the people to get some of those other things done, and hopefully we'll get that one sold within the month. Okay, and once you sell it. Uh, what kind of profit will you make off of it? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> a good profit, a bad profit, a negative profit. Um, no, no, I, I'm thinking, um, I should, I should make ten to twenty thousand dollars. Okay, so ten to twenty thousand dollars, and I'm imagining if you had started with fifty and you were able to buy two properties, you're probably around twenty five thousand into the into this particular property? I spent, I think I, this was a four bedroom, one bath, and I think we paid 25 for it. 25. And we probably put 
another 15 in it. Okay. Some of that was unexpected. So I think I've got about 40 in so it. you got about 40 in it. And you they're think telling you'll... me it should sell from 50 to 60. Great. So you could make ten dollars to $20,000. I could. And that's tax. This is a traditional type IRA. Traditional IRA. IRA. Yep. Which means you don't pay taxes till you start withdrawing. I take it out. It. Right. So really that, that profit grows tax free. Yes. That's fantastic. It is. It's a that's, wonderful program. That's you know. a, uh, that could be a, um, you know, anywhere from a 25 to 50% return on your investment there. Way better than, <laughs> way better than I was getting in the stock market where I was losing money on a regular basis. And I'm sure your, uh, your stockbroker is probably <laughs> shedding a tear right now, <laughs> wishing you would come back to him. Yeah, well, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's Muskegon, but you do have one last property left in Grand Rapids that I you're do. hanging on to. I do. Tell us about that, and there, there's a story there, so I want to <laughs> I want to hear the story. Well, I, I have a uh, I have a dear friend who, uh, when we were in the car wreck, I was managing this five unit myself. You know, so I'm over there mowing the lawn and doing what repairs all my thumbs will do, and and. Uh, coordinating things. And my friend was quite a handyman. And so he would help me. I could call on him. So when we we're in the hospital, he just stepped up and started managing the property, the five unit, you know, and, and um, uh, he came to me after we got out of the hospital and started uh, recovering a little bit and said, Hey, why don't we do some rehabbing? Well, I've just been to the RPOA conference and here's Robin Thompson, the queen of rehab, telling about all the money she's made and all the adventures she's had rehabbing properties. And my friend says, uh, if you'll buy them, I'll rehab them. We'll split the profits. He says, we should be able to do six a year. And I'm like, okay, that sounds really good to me. So rehab and flip? Yeah, mm -hmm. that was the plan. And um, so we found a two unit that... I, we bought it out of foreclosure and it looked to me like someone had started the rehab process and maybe ran out of funds, that sort of thing. Cause everything was stripped down, uh, but nothing had been rebuilt. And so, uh, so my friend is going to, we're, we've got this agreement. We're going to do this and away we go. Well, you know, my wife is having surgery after surgery and I'm recovering and, and so I'm, I'm not really staying on top of this very much. And, uh, but things aren't really happening, you know, so you have a come to Jesus meeting with your friend and, you know, okay, yeah, things are going to change. I've got this and that and the other thing, and this is going and I will fix it, you know? Well, almost two years later, and several come to Jesus meetings. He just never made it all the way to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> he went away from Jesus. <laughs> and I, this, is, this guy is a good friend of mine. He's still a good friend. But I finally had to say, look, this is not working. This does not seem to be an area of your strength. You're really good with people. You're really good in several other areas, but somehow this is just not working. I need to, I, we need to end this. And so I paid him for uh, what he had done. And then I began finding people to finish the job. And uh, it took, I don't know, it took me a couple of months, I think, to get everything finished that he hadn't got. So it took and, him two years and then it took you two months. <laughs> Well, I think he just had a lot of distractions and was having a hard time. You know, when you're working on somebody else's property, but you're in charge, you want to make sure you do it right. And, you know, I think there were just some of those some of those kinds of things happening there that just made it difficult for him to make decisions and schedule things and move, uh, move the move the uh, plan forward. So we got it rehabbed. We got tenants in it. And um uh, I like this property. I like this too. You know, I like the people that are in it. I'm still managing it. I'm over there every week to mow the lawn and and uh, you know touch base with the ladies that are there. And and uh, it's just uh, uh, I had put it on the market for a little while uh, along with the five unit, but then the five unit sold or is selling, and I'm going to have to find all these properties to fix that. So I just took it off the market, and I'll just enjoy some cash flow here for a while mm -hmm. <laughs> from that one. Yeah, so you're happy with that one. It 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 seems to be doing well. How much did you pick it up for? We paid forty seven for it. Forty seven. How much yep. did you end up putting into it? We've probably put another thirty to forty in it, 
So Something you're like you're that. looking at uh, probably eighty, ninety thousand. Yeah, I'm um, told. Was it vacant for those two years? Yes, it was. So, it's, <laughs> so that, that's you put that money into it, but it sat vacant. So it no did. Cash oh flow. my goodness! Yeah, that was just painful. Okay. <laughs> so how recently did you? Uh, or when when did you finally get it up and running? Um, he he put a tenant in. It. Well, here's another thing that I didn't realize. He got the 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 ground floor apartment done, and he put a tenant in it. Well, the upstairs wasn't done. We didn't have a COC or, <laughs> oh, okay. or anything. So so now he's out of the picture, and I'm dealing with things and finding out. Oh my goodness! You know what? We replaced the furnaces. There wasn't a permit from the city pool. And I'm like, mm. oh no, we've got to fix all this stuff. You know, uh, um, I don't know. I don't understand. So he all left that. you quite a mess. Yeah, to, yeah, to it with. was a mess. It was a mess. Wow. And I think the inspector was pretty ticked because stuff had been done. There's a tenant in there, you know, and there's no COC. Um, so we, we were able to just say, Hey, look, you know, here, I've got this five unit. I'm, I'm, I had a friend doing this. I didn't know I'm recovering from a wreck. You know, I didn't, I wasn't aware that this was what was happening. And I think we got him mollified and, and, and got things repaired and got things back in order and got the COC and away we go. So you so, have, uh, you have both units rented. Yes. What both kind of, what rented. kind of rents are you getting? Uh, six seventy five for the one bedroom downstairs, eight hundred for the two bedroom up. Okay, As, and you're making some good cash flow. On yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Good, good for you. So I, I'm curious because you, there's there's a recurring theme <laughs> of trust. You, you trusted the woman who sold you the five unit. Yeah, yeah. There the, you go. The electrical had been uh, all updated. Um, you trusted your friend for yep. two years <laughs> while he was making a big mess. Yeah. And uh, um, there was one other story of trust there. Oh, your your uh, your stockbroker who oh, yeah. <laughs> who kind of um, you know didn't quite follow your instructions the way you you wanted. So what 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 is your feeling? I mean, you, you being a pastor and a, and a Christian, I mean, obviously you're inclined to trust other people, right. And give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Real estate, however, is a, is a harsh. <laughs> Teacher. Harsh taskmaster. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure what my question is, but I'm. But I guess it boils down to how has your perspective on other people and your ability to trust them changed through the experiences you've had with real estate? Well, Brian, I don't want to be a bitter, cynical person. You know, uh, I, I would rather trust somebody and get. Um, and be disappointed than be a cynical, bitter, you know, untrusting person. I guess the thing that, I, that I've, I mean, I haven't told you the stories about trusting tenants. You know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you let your pastor's uh -huh. heart make choices, you know, about real estate and tenants. That this was a learning curve that went over backwards there. Um, so, so again, I don't want to be a cynical, bitter person. So I, but I'm learning not to be hesitant about asking questions and not to be uh, and knowing better what questions to ask uh, and then um, and then not not hesitating to hold people's feet to the fire you know um, okay you say you're going to do this you've said you're going to do this for the last two months you haven't done this how are we going to fix this? You know, um, one of the things that I learned as a pastor, I can't work harder on other people's problems than they're willing to work. You know, and that same thing sort of applies here. You know, you have to be, uh, you can't be hesitant to hold people accountable. I have a friend who's a missionary in Russia, and he has a beautiful home in Florida that he's renting out, right? He, so he's just... I don't know if he's read Kiyosaki's book or not, but he's just, uh, he bought another house in another uh, town where he had moved for a rental and he's got section eight tenants in it. So he's going through sort of the learning curve. Well, he's renting his beautiful home to another person who's in the ministry. And I'm talking to him over Magic Jack the other day and he's going, well, like, you know, this guy's in the ministry, but he's really having trouble. And, and I come to find out he's like three months behind at 2,500 bucks a month. You know, and my friend is my friend is letting his pastor's heart make real estate decisions. And now I'm like, 
John, <laughs> buddy, <laughs> evict the sucker, you know? I don't care if he is in the ministry. He's a deadbeat. Get him out of there. That's the best thing for you. And honestly, it's the best thing for him too, you know? So, uh, so I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not as uh, compassionate as I used to be. Maybe I'm just a little more realistic. And, you know, again, knowing what questions to ask and not being afraid to ask questions. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I think you don't want to upset people, you know, so you don't ask hard. Eh, forget that. <laughs> ask the questions, get the answers. Then you know what to do. You have a better idea of what to do because you've got better information. Yeah, I, th I think it was Ronald Reagan who put it best. <laughs> Trust, but verify. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I like, what well, I forget what other president it was. Maybe it was Roosevelt that said, walk softly, but carry a big stick. Uh -huh. So you, <laughs> yeah. you have you had to carry a big stick now? Well, you have to, you know, I had I had a fellow that just was a con man that was living in one of my apartments. Yeah, tell me about that. You, so you Holy tell me the, the con man story. This guy was just, I mean, he was nice looking. He was... Uh, and he had a great story, you know, and um, and so I'd go talk to him and, well, you know, I've got this line on this job and, you know, and I'll have this tomorrow or, you know, and this went on week after week after week until finally um, I, I'm talking to my neighbor there and my neighbor says to me, Lonnie, this guy's a hustler. <laughs> Get him out of there. <laughs> And so, you know, when it's when you're confronted with it, that you well, uh, what did your neighbor know that you didn't know? That this guy was a hustler. <laughs> 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 that I couldn't believe any of the things that he was selling me, you know. Um, and, and and you know, my my neighbor there sits out on his porch and watches everything that's coming and going in and out and all around, you know. So he had his pulse on the heartbeat of everything that was happening. And you can see this guy was just you know, he was a con man. So, you know, you, you serve the eviction papers and you get them out and, and, and you're, you don't have to be mean. You don't have to be ugly. You know, you just do what you have to do to get the thing squared away. Is that difficult for you to evict your tenants? Not nearly as much now as it used to be. <laughs> so you've had to get over that resistance of the, your pastor's heart. Yeah. And your, your, you have to be realistic. Forgiveness and yeah. all that. And now you're more realistic. Well, I had I had two women uh, that were a, a, a tenants in the upstairs apartment. There was a two bedroom, and one was an older lady who had been in the army. I mean, this woman was a sergeant in the army. She was hardcore, and then her little eighteen year old friend. And um, when they moved out, they deliberately left the place a mess. I think they owed me a thousand bucks or so, and um, so I'm over there. Some months later, I'm working outside there. And um, uh, the younger girl comes walking up and says, uh, well, you don't remember me, do you? And I go, well, you look familiar. Who are you? And so she tells me who she was. Once I know her name, then I recognize her. And, and, and uh, in a few minutes, here comes the sergeant, you know, down the street. And she goes, well, we're just wondering if we might be able to rent from you again. <laughs> mm. And I looked at her and I said, uh, I called her by name and I said, now look, you left owing me a thousand bucks and you deliberately left the place filthy. How would it make me look like a genius to rent to you again? You know, well, she didn't have any answer to that question and they wandered off down the street. I don't know if even as a pastor, I would have rented to him again. I had <laughs> at least that much practicality to it, but it wasn't hard to say no. You know, mm -hmm. Let me just put it that way. It wasn't hard to say no. What's the meanest thing you've ever had to do as a landlord? Uh, um, well, I, fi I finally got a judgment against one of my tenants and went to garnish their wages. You know, that seems pretty mean. You know, the flip side of it, you have to look at it like this. If these people were putting a gun to your head and saying, give me your money, then then you would realize they're stealing from me. When they just don't pay the rent, it doesn't seem quite as um, confrontational as someone holding a gun on, on you, you know? But that's what they're doing. They're, they're stealing. stealing. They're stealing from me. And uh, the problem with garnishing wages is that all they have to do is quit that job and move to the next one, and then you've got to go through the whole court system to follow them, and it didn't work. 
Mm. It didn't work. Yeah, it's a tricky one to garnish wages. But not only is it unfair to you and they're stealing from you, but it's unfair to the tenants who are paying. Absolutely. Because why, you know, then they start wondering, well, if this person's getting away right. with, with not paying, why should I pay? <laughs> and then it's a slippery slope from there. There you go. And the slippery slope ends with an empty wallet for the landlord. Yeah. <laughs> So what uh, what have I not asked you that maybe um, I should? I can't think of anything, Brian. You've been a great interviewer here. <laughs> I, I would just Ask emphasize. All the questions. <laughs> I would just emphasize again the great benefits that the RPOA provides. You know um, the the conference. You know the speakers that they bring into the conference were so helpful to me, and I've. Uh, you know, Tony Young's was here in town not too long ago, and I went through his weekend uh, boot camp thing, you know, looking at hidden market stuff. And um, I drove down to Ohio a few weeks ago to be in a one day thing with Ron Legrand. I guess Ron was one of uh, Robin Thompson's gurus, you know. Uh, Robin was the first one that I I saw that really piqued my interest. I loved her story. And she's such a great storyteller, you know, that it just really sucks you in. <clears throat> so um, that was part of why we looked at rehabbing that two unit was Robin's influence and her story. Um, I don't think rehabbing is what, <laughs> I don't think that's my forte. It's didn't not, go work, so well for not working out too well. Yeah. But but it is now. I guess you've got yes. to rent it. Yes, you just have flowing. to. You have to make it all the way through to the end. You can't stop in the middle of the story. Sure. Um, yeah. And by the way, the the annual conference for the RPOA is typically in February. Yep. Uh, last last weekend in February, right around there, uh, at the DeVos Center Convention Center, and right. um, and it's in, free. Uh, Grand Rapids, and it's free, which is the best part about it. There you but go. well, actually, the best part is the networking, the people yes. you meet the professionals uh, who come in and, and teach yes. you things that you may not have been aware of. Yep, absolutely. And this is, uh, there are so many wonderful people that are involved in the RPOA that are willing to answer questions. I mean, you've, you introduced me to software to help me. And when I called you and asked you questions about it, and you were very gracious to answer my stupid questions, taking advantage of the resources that are available here in Grand Rapids in the RPOA and the REI, that's, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you hang around with people that know more than you, you know? Yeah. It's a great networking opportunity. You meet so many uh, smart, active yep. people, people yep. who are actually doing it. Yeah. Well, Lonnie, thanks so much for uh, for uh, <laughs> taking the time to talk with me today. You are doing it. You know, you've, you've been doing it here in Grand Rapids, moving into Muskegon. You know, we'll miss you here in Grand Rapids. <laughs> I'll keep coming to the breakfast on Fridays <laughs> and coming to the classes. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. My pleasure, Brian. Thank you. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.